So what is sync licensing and how do you get into it? I'm gonna give you all the info on it today. Let's go. What's up, people? Welcome to the channel. This is Clint on behalf of airbit.com, and I'm here to drop some more music licensing gems on you today. And I feel like music licensing is one of these like mysterious areas of the music industry where everyone wants to know, like, how do you break into it? Like, who do you send music to? What do the deals look like? How do you get paid? All of these questions that I am going to answer in this video today. So my name is Clint and I've been in the music licensing space since around 2012. I've got my music placed on networks such as NBC, CBS, Fox Sports, NFL Network, MTV, A&E, Bravo, E, and the list goes on. So it's been a lot of placements. I've been fortunate enough to work on some really cool shows and films and things like that. So I'm here to share everything that I've learned over these past few years about music licensing and help you get into music licensing as well. If that's something you want to do, you may not want to do it. I don't know, but I think you should. So let's start with the basics. What is music licensing? So music licensing is pretty much just the permission to put your music to picture, right? Or to that can be a TV show, that can be a film, some type of media, right? Anytime you synchronize music to picture, you need what's called a sync license. And that's what music licensing is. It's just licensing your music, giving production companies the right and permission to use your music so they can put it, you know, behind the video or along with the video or picture or what, whatever's going on in the particular media that you are placing your music in. So now that we got that out of the way, how do you get started? Like, where do you send your music to to even take advantage of these opportunities? And that's a great question, right? Because there's multiple approaches you can take. You have what's called a music supervisor who kind of oversees all the music being used and placed in a particular production. So you may be able to, you know, try and find a music supervisor or a music coordinator or a music editor. All these people have their hands in some way, shape or form in the production and in the decision making process of music being used in the particular production. Now, the tricky part about, you know, the, the music supervisor reaching out to a music soup is that most of them are super duper busy. Honestly, I haven't met a music supervisor who wasn't extremely busy. And, you know, they like to work with people who, number one, they like and people that they trust and know can deliver in a timely manner. So if you're just starting out, you're, you're just learning the whole music licensing space, you know, how files are delivered and just how things work, it may be harder for you to get in touch directly with a music supervisor, but there is an easier way. And I'm gonna share that way with you right now. So the approach that I give producers when I'm teaching them how to get their music placed in TV and film is going through what's called a music library or music licensing company. What a music library is, is essentially a publisher, right? But they just focus primarily on TV, film and media. So, you know, examples of these music libraries can be Million Ducks Music or JinglePunks.com or ProducersToolbox.com or TuneEdge.com, AudioSparks.com, like like these are some of the companies that you can go and search and you'll see like, you know, that they focus on TV film placements and you can go that a lot of them have like a submission portal or some way to submit to them to be included in their library. So it's not hard at all. They're very approachable and they're always looking for new dope music to use. So it's a great opportunity for indie producers like yourself and, and artists even to get inside those catalogs where they already have relationships with music supervisors and editors already established. So music libraries is a perfect way to get started if you're trying to get your music placed in TV and film. You can also do a Google search. There's plenty of them out there. You have some of the bigger companies like BMG Production Music and APM Music who also list like a ton of other libraries that you can reach out to personally and see if they're accepting submission. So once you partner up with a music library, right? Say you got accepted to one of the companies I mentioned before or another music library that you found online, like what happens next? What do the deals look like? What, how is it structured? Things like that. So let's talk about that a little bit, right? So 
Usually in music licensing or when you partner up with a, a publisher or music library, you're gonna see two types of deals. One is gonna be an exclusive deal and the other one is gonna be a non-exclusive deal, right? So the exclusive deal means that, and it's gonna depend from company to company, but the type of deals that I prefer, you know, to look for is the exclusive deal, meaning that this one beat that I made, I can sign to your company, Library A, we'll call it, and I know now that once company A or once beat A, company A, library A signs this one track, I can't send this track to any other library until that term is over. So they're the only ones that can represent and publish that on your behalf for the term of that agreement. But you're still able to make new tracks. So say track two, three, four, five, and send those to library B, which could be another exclusive library, as long as they have similar terms. Or you may wanna partner up with some non-exclusive libraries and send track two, three, four, five to that library as well. So that's usually what exclusive means in the, in the music library space. Now let's talk about the non-exclusive deal, right? Non-exclusive is pretty straightforward. It pretty much means, it's kind of like the same thing as beat leasing, right? Like you give multiple non-exclusive libraries the right to publish and pitch this music on your behalf. So now if you're dealing with a non-exclusive track that you signed to a non-exclusive library, you just have to be sure you don't send that track to an exclusive agreement or an exclusive library because then you could create confusion. It may not want to work with you anymore and it just creates a big headache as far as who's representing what. So what I recommend is create like two piles of music, right? Have one that you know you're gonna send off for exclusive deals and have one that you know has been sent to some non-exclusive stuff and you can just send that to only non-exclusive libraries or agreements that you have in place with those libraries. So those are the two deals that you'll typically see. Now, how do you get paid? That's, that's a pretty important question. So in music licensing, you can get paid a couple ways, right? You'll have what's called an upfront sync fee. So this could be, hey, we wanna use your, your music in this movie. Here's the fee to sync it, you know, to, to license the, the master and the publishing or whatever. So here's a fee for that upfront. You take that now, you don't have to wait, you know, till it comes out and royalties and all this stuff. You just get an upfront fee. So you can get that in addition to back-end royalties. And then sometimes it's only back-end royalties. I know a lot of the reality TV stuff that I've produced music for, such as Love & Hip Hop and Black Ink Crew and Keeping Up With The Kardashians and a bunch of others, most of those were only back-end royalties, right? So there was no upfront fee that I received from that. But the back-end royalties add up because shows like that, they replay over and over and over again, like all around the world and in different countries. So over time, it can really add up. So those are the two ways you get paid. Now, in order to get your back end royalties, you have to make sure you're registered with a PRO. It's a performer rights organization. In the US, that's BMI, ASCAP, CSAC. In Canada, you have SOCAN. And then just depending on which country you're in, that may vary. But you have to make sure you're registered with the PRO so you can collect those performance royalties. Those are the ones that will collect and distribute those royalties out to you once you earn them. So another question I get a lot is, you know, which ones get placed the most, instrumentals or full songs? And honestly, it's a combination of both. There's opportunities for both. If you're a producer and you only wanna focus on producing instrumentals for TV and film, there's plenty of opportunities for that. I was looking on one of my recent royalty statements and noticed like one episode of, of a show that I produced music for had like 140 something pieces of music used and all of this was instrumental music. So there's plenty of opportunities if you just wanna focus on, you know, sending beats off and, and things like that, plenty of opportunities for that. And then you also have plenty of opportunities for full songs. You know, a lot of shows are using a lot of independent music for shows and movies because it's cheaper than going with a major artist or a hot song. So what they'll do is reach out to, you know, these music libraries, these publishers who specialize in TV and film, and they'll ask, hey, do you have some music that sounds like the latest Drake single or the latest Jay-Z single or Rihanna or whoever's hot at the moment, right? So there's plenty of opportunities and it's a great opportunity for indie artists to step in, create some additional income with their music. It can also be a great marketing tool to increase exposure with your music being used and you being associated with these big networks and, and TV and film production. 
Now, if you want to focus on pitching music for songs, when you're looking for music libraries, like we talked about before, when you're doing your search and research, just make sure those libraries represent full songs as well. And a lot of them do. A lot of them have like a mix. And then there's some where they're, they're more boutique licensing companies where they focus primarily on pushing and pitching artists. So just make sure you do your research before you submit, before you reach out to make sure you know that library is gonna be a good fit for what you do. Now let's talk about the structure, right? Structure is very, very important, especially if you're producing instrumentals for TV and film. It's not the same as producing music for artists, right? So I've produced music for some artists as well, such as Tamar Braxton and Case and Dondria and Tyon Christian and some other artists, but it's different, right? Because in, in those settings, we're producing full records, full songs. Some of, a lot of them have bridges and things like that. Some of them may have had intros that are longer than you know, 10 seconds or whatever, because, you know, as an artist and you're producing music for albums, you kind of have that, you know, that flexibility to be creative and, and do creative things with intros and outros and bridges and things like that. But for TV, a lot of the times editors are looking for specific elements and specific structure that helps them and gives them flexibility to make certain cuts and edits to play certain pieces of your track in the film. For example, you may have the first section of your first verse start off sparse and there's not a lot of instrumentation, but then your second section could build up with a little bit more instrumentation and they may take those two parts, split them in half and use them in two different places. So you're actually increasing your chances of your music being used. Also, music for TV and film, intros are very, very short. You wanna get straight to the point. I usually recommend no longer than like 12, 14 seconds for an intro and just get right into it. For TV and film music, I'm usually not even throwing bridges in there, you know? My length, average length is about a minute and a half to two minutes long, and then that's it. Another important element you wanna have if you're composing music for TV and film is, is what's called a sting ending. You wanna have a definite hard ending at the end of your track versus having the track slowly fade out. Usually music supervisors and editors do not like fade outs because it makes it more challenging for them to do a transition from scene to scene while the track is just slowly fading out. Now, of course, you may have some of those exceptions that may happen if a song is just that great and it fits that well with a particular scene and mood. But just to be on the safe side, make sure you're structuring your instrumentals properly so you can optimize them for placement and just make sure your songs, when it comes down to lyrics, make sure they're not super specific so that you know the lyrics are broad enough to be applied to multiple situations to increase your chances for your full songs being placed. For example, if you have a song that's mentioning a certain city and a certain year and a certain date and certain people and names, that may not have as high of a chance as getting placed as a song where the lyrics are about living life, having fun, you know, winning, taking over, things like that. Things that are broad and can be applied to multiple situations without specific names and dates and things like that being dropped. Also, if you're a producer, I'm sorry, but you gotta, you gotta take your producer tags out. Usually they don't like producer tags, so just take those out if you're pitching your music to TV and film as well. Now, another hot topic in the music licensing world is samples. If you're a producer and you primarily sample, which man, like I give you mad props because like I'm not a good sampler, but it's super dope. Like I, just, I love people who sample. I love you sample producer. But if you sample, unfortunately, it's gonna be difficult in the licensing world because a lot of times they don't want to go through the headaches of clearing samples even some of the royalty free loops that are out there on sites like splice.com can cause headaches if you're not manipulating them and making them super duper unique to where they're not recognized um, if you take a sample offline and there's another producer who used it the exact same way that can can hold things up in production and clearance because now they're trying to figure out like who owns what so us producers and composers on the sync side we tend to stay away from samples altogether just to make things just clean and simple on the clearance side and it just makes life a little bit easier if you still want that sample vibe, I would just recommend um, taking some some original music that you've made and just kind of, you know, sample that just to, you know, give it that that sample vibe if, if that's the vibe that you have. So you don't run into any issues with just, you know, clearance stuff. <sighs>
Wow, so I know that that was a lot, but uh, I wanted to give you as much information as possible to help you get started in this music licensing space. If you wanna see the six steps that I took to start getting my music placed, click the link in the description to grab my free six step guide to getting TV placements so you can reference that and know if you're on the right track. If you like the video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And if you're on Discord or even if you're not on Discord, get Discord and join the Arabic community. The link to that will be in the description as well. All right, guys, I'm out and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Oh, oh.